third week of the ICAM. Thank you very much for being here. And this week uh, is um, the, the, the sort of focus of this week is light matter interaction. And um, what we'll be concentrating on, the lectures will be about uh, laser micromanipulation in all its shapes and forms with little particles and atoms, etc. We'll be talking about precision measurement and quantum measurement. We'll be talking about quantum information and, um, uh, and a little bit of imaging. So it's quite varied program, very good speakers. And Kishan is first of them. So Professor Kishan Dolakia comes from the University of St. Andrews and has done, uh, has done a lot of work in laser micromanipulation, optical tweezers and uh, very special beams used in optical tweezers and he will be talking a lot about all of it. And um, uh, there are a lot of very interesting phenomena that he and his group have been uh, investigating as far as laser micromanipulation is concerned. So we will let Kishan start. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Helena and Ivan for this wonderful opportunity to be here. In, uh, in Brisbane for uh, the final week of this course. So hopefully you're not all lectured out or workshopped out and you'll just stay on board for what promises to be a very interesting week. Um, so it's, uh, I'm from the University of um, St Andrews in Scotland um, and uh, to climatise myself I came a few days ago. <laughs> Otherwise I probably would have It's actually now approaching uh, 11.30 to 12 I guess. Midnight, that's back home in Scotland. Um, Scotland's a very small country, only 5 million people, and it's actually extremely rare for me to travel anywhere. It's actually colder than Scotland typically at any time of the year. But in fact, at the moment, we're undergoing somewhat of a, an amazing heat wave in yeah, that's Europe. A and that's Scotland that's hasn't missed out, thankfully, this time. We've had, I think, one of our best dunes on record. And um, it's been a really a real pleasure. So I'm underestimating the amount of clothes I need to survive here, but we'll see how we go. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give four lectures, I think two today and two a little bit later in the weekend. I'm going to complement the really exciting work that you're going to see from other colleagues in this field. I think Helena, Carlos Lenz, Matthias Box, or maybe others particularly related to my field. So I'm going to try and complement that. And what I'm going to do is try and kick off today with a very introductory lecture to get, basically give you the concepts. Uh, of this field from a very pedagogical point of view, but also interactive. I hope everybody can hear me. I don't like using the microphone. Um, okay, great. That's cool. All right. So this is St Andrews. It's uh, the third oldest university in Scotland, founded in 1411, when historically we couldn't send students to France because England and France, but they still have disputes, don't they? But um, they've had lots of disputes about 600 years ago. Um, this is the old part of the university. This is one of the three ancient colleges and salvators, that's the chapel. And if, you're, if you study at St Andrews and get married, it's a beautiful old chapel, so it's one of the privileges. This is the, this is the beach, this is the West Sands. Uh, for some of you, probably, you were probably born around that time. Um, there was a film in the 1980s called Chariots of Fire, with a famous soundtrack by Van Gogh, which was an Oscar winner, which was talking about um, the Olympic effort from the UK. And that was actually all filmed here. So it's there, and that there used to be the old physics building. Um, and St. So, so Andrew's physics is, uh, was renowned for low temperature work, but of course with modern laboratories, you can not do not too dissimilar to the ones you'll see here, I imagine, in a laptop, sadly buildings like this aren't really capable of housing modern facilities in photonics, and so now everything's moved to a whole suite of activities in another part of the uh, uh, university. Um, that's my website there, and of course I'll be around the whole week should you find anything I say of interest and want to come and have a chat or more detail. Where is it geographically? This is the UK, so the UK is really, really small, so as you know, I mean, that's, that's an hour to fly from London to Edinburgh, this and Andrew's there. Okay, so it's just about an hour by car, and it's actually the driest part of the UK, uh, because statistics can prove anything, so you can read into that what you will. Um, we get a lot of the weather and the water. This is the North Sea here, and we get the Gulf Stream coming up here, so you get a feeling for where St Andrews actually is. St Andrews is essentially famous for two things. It's uh, the university, but also the most dominant thing is the golf. 
Oh. For those of you who are into golf, golf in St Andrews is the essential equivalent of playing soccer or football. It's, it's where everything, kids do it right up to adults, everyone who ever did a competition for golf. And in approximately one week's time, we have the fourth, uh, the third major of the year. So, so that you know a little bit about golf, and the four main tournaments that every, every golfer dreams of winning are the majors. So you've got the US Masters, the US Open, the British Open, and then the PGA. Okay, so the third Open this year cycles between sites in the UK, and this year, every five years, it comes to St Andrews, and uh, the last two times in 2000 and 2005, this guy won it. So we'll see what happens next year because things aren't perhaps as you know, sailing for in these days as they perhaps once were. So that's the 18th green, that's the Royal Age Clubhouse where golf was founded, and that's five minutes walk from the department. Okay. What about the facility? So this is where we are. Um, that's, that's the physics building there. You can park your car nice and easily, and this is the, what we call the North Hall. And this red spot, well, it, the mind view used to be out towards all that beautiful greenery you saw, but of course in, in the current, current climate of building and expanding, which even St Andrews can't avoid, what we've done is put a big building in the way. And it's a new medical school now, so this is actually a physical link to uh, the physics building, and we have about seven new labs there. And the building costs 45 million pounds, and was placed there rather um, due to the work of myself and colleagues in the genre of photonics with biology and medicine to foster links. So we're now doing some exciting work there. I've lost my view, but I guess hopefully I'm getting some, plus it's a new lab anyway. <laughs> we'll see. What does it look like from the top? Just to give you a view, there we are. That was my view across to here. Sadly, that's gone now. But um, we get a new cafeteria in the new building. And there's the beach. So you can, and there's the 18th. There's the Royal Ancient, and that's the last hole. All right, anyway, that's enough PR and telling you where I've come from. It's very small. It's only 40,000 people. Um, but let's get on to some science. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split my talk into four, of course. So today I'm going to cover in two lectures with a break, I guess, the history of optical trapping a little bit and give you some insight into how it works. Uh, I'm going to assume that there's no, there's no experts here, which are really very basic. All the slides will be available as a PDF, if, should you wish, and um, I'm around, as I say, all week, should you want any papers or more information on any aspect of what I describe. Um, so I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to go on to multiple traps and novel lightning to give you the flavour, and then in the two lectures later in the week, I'll give you some more advanced um, ideas of where we can take things. So on the, art, on the right is an artist's impression, of, uh, done by an artist at SPIE, I think, for us, for a, a feature article in their newspaper, and of course, like many artists' impression of scientific endeavours, it's completely inaccurate, but it does capture the essence and captures the reader's imagination. And the idea is that light can actually exert forces on matter. The light-matter interaction can take many forms, as you'll hear this week, and in addition to actually um, encoding for things like quantum information, <coughs> and interaction and preparing atoms, molecules, etc. in certain states, incredibly, the light from this very laser pointer has sufficient momentum that can be transferred to objects from a, size, from a single atom right through to the size of a large cell and make a difference. And they can do this with no damage typically whatsoever. That's the key to the whole area. Okay? From that, everything hopefully you'll see this week and maybe here elsewhere will spawn. Okay? So that's what we're going to look at. Light forces have been known for a very long time. We don't need to um, go, this is the 50th anniversary of the laser. It's actually the 40th anniversary of the first paper showing any form of optical micromanipulation. However, we don't have to wait for the laser to uh, think about how force light can exert forces. There are a number of experiments at the beginning of the 20th century, but we can go right back to the time of Johannes Kepler. And Kepler, of course, as we all know, looked to the laws of planetary motion. He was interested in a lot of things, and with his colleague Tycho Brahe, basically developed a lot of the theory and experimental work that we understand the basic understanding of the solar system, in fact. However, in addition to being interested in planets, he was also interested in why the tail of the comet just points away from the sun. Okay? And this is actually data from a NASA space satellite showing that. Um, the trajectory is actually not directly away from the sun, due to reasons I won't go into at the moment. 
but basically it does that here, it's blocking out the solar disk. So he worried about that, and he conjectured in between the hypothesizing his math and Sally's mother was um, blamed for witchcraft, which was a pretty serious uh, allegation in those days with dire consequences. He actually wished to, um, he, he actually stated that it, there was some kind of solar pressure, some kind of big force exerted from the sun that could actually push particulate matter off the body. <coughs> and essentially we know he's right. Um, some of you may have read about NASA's endeavours recently to uh, launch solar sails as ways of getting across the solar system. Okay, so these are endeavours that are ongoing, and there's disputes about them. And also, for those of you interested, and I won't dwell on this, think about demonstrations such as the Crookes radiometer, which is a beautiful fan, but shiny in a dark sun, and the way it can spin when light actually falls upon it. And it actually goes around, not in the way that you might expect, but I'll leave that for a discussion perhaps, for those of you who might have heard of it. If you're not interested, don't worry. But that's how we do things. Of course, we don't have light sources on the sun with the sort of flux on Earth, sorry, with the sort of flux that the sun exerts. And so, in fact, the forces that we're going to talk about this week are mostly restricted to this size scale, right down to a single atom. All right. Now, the force, the way that exert the force can be exerted or even at all, actually ultimately depends on our ability to transfer the momentum, whether it's linear or angular, to the body of the atom. That's basically the nutshell when you've got to concentrate. And that can depend on various parameters, such as the relative refractive index, birefringent properties of the object, other, many other things. It could even be, for example, in the atomic domain, whether it's a dipole transition or a quadrupole. Those are the types of things you get into when you get into the nitty gritty. How much momentum and force and torque one can exert on any body that if we wish. It turns out that this is a size scale that's around the maximum, and we go right down to a single atom. So, that's the sort of size scale compared to human hair. Now, you might say, well, that's, is that really interesting? Well, I'd actually like to pull my beer glass across a desk or something. Well, in fact, of course, that would be very nice, but in fact, if you wanted to do that, um, I, so I can't exactly exert the force with this laser pointer myself, but this is a very size scale down to the atom where there's an immense amount of physics that we can do. And the beautiful thing about light is it's non-invasive, can interact beautifully with, with, these, with matter at this scale, and we can understand exciting things. So, just to wake everybody up, let's start with a little bit of a, a quiz, okay? So, here's a block of wood. So, I like doing problem, I do these sort of thinking out, thinking like a physicist classes and things like this. So, this is one of the problems. So, I've got a block of wood, and I've got a little gun or an or air rifle or something, and I've got two bullets. One's aluminium, and one's rubber. They're both exactly the same shape, mass, etc. And they'll come out of the rifle with exactly the same speed. All right? Okay? And I have two objectives in this experiment. All right? So maybe it's over there. One is I want to knock the block over. <coughs> and the second objective will be I want to damage the block. And I'm wondering if there is any difference in either of those two bullets for that purpose. Okay. So. I would like to know firstly, which one's most likely to knock the block over? Who thinks it's the rubber bullet? Alright, so that's, yeah, it's about a third to a half. Who thinks it's the aluminium bullet? Alright, two. Who thinks they should be the same? Right, there isn't a D, so a lot of people have <laughs> said nothing. So, who thinks they're both the same? One. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the damage the block. Then. Who thinks the rubber bullet's the easiest one to damage the block? Who thinks the aluminium? One person thinks the rubber. Who thinks the aluminium bullet's the one to damage the block? Right. Biggest consensus so far. So nearly half. But just over half. Then. And who thinks they're both the same? Right. Okay. Okay. Let's let's think of it in a more simple way. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I've got a squash ball in my. That's I don't know if you call it squash here. Squash? And I've got a golf ball. There's the ball. If I throw a squash ball at the wall, what's it going to do? Back. Right. What is, what's going to happen if I throw a golf ball at the wall? The ball straight down. Sorry? It's going to fall down. Right. And I'll probably have to run because I'll probably get sued for damaging the building, right? Because it'll probably create a dent in the wall. Okay? 
Right, now you can see there's a difference, even though if I throw the squash and the golf ball at the same speed, and why is that? So, someone who said, um, why, why did someone who's the first one, someone who said rubber, anybody who said, who said rubber, to knock me, why did you say rubber? Come on. If they've got the same mass and speed, then they have the same momentum going into it, and if the rubber bullet bounces off, you have to transfer the momentum, all of its forward momentum, plus whatever momentum it gains going backwards, which is more than the bullet stopping the block. Textbook answer. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> well, no, I Monday morning. <laughs> You're going to do well. Uh, right, so, excellent. So, the idea is, if I throw a, a rubber bullet, okay, the mass is mv, it comes back, v reverses, so the change of momentum is 2mv. If I throw an aluminium bullet, just like the squash ball, so a golf ball idea, it will stop. All right, so the maximum I'll probably transfer with the aluminium bullet is 1 mv. All right? So if I want to transfer the maximum momentum and therefore get the maximum force to knock it over, the rubber bullet is actually what I want. Now, what about damage? I've just given you the answer to that. So the answer there is the aluminium. Why is that? The kinetic energy is half mv squared. If the rubber bullet bounces back towards me with, let's say, more or less the same velocity, half mv squared is hardly changed. So the amount of energy transferred to the block is really small. All right? Whereas with the aluminium bullet, it's likely to get embedded or stuck or damage the block just like I damage the wall with golf ball. So in fact, the aluminium is most likely to damage the block. And this is where you go up the front wall, probably on a dyslexic issue. So, you have to understand the difference between momentum and energy. Pretty straightforward concepts, but subtle. Now, why on earth am I talking to you about golf balls, squash balls, rubber, aluminium bullets? Because that's not the topic of this lecture. Because that's exactly the way Arthur Ashkin and other colleagues in the late 1960s decided to think about the forces of light. So when the laser came around with Theodore Mendel's wonderful work, and of course Towns are shallow, this is a really, this is the type of back of the envelope calculation you should do. What is the force on a the mirror? There's light. Light's got momentum. The De Broglie relationship tells us it's H over lambda. So what's the force? Well, excellent little question. Put the numbers in. N, N dot's the number of photons. H over lambda C. Momentum is H over lambda here. Force is rate of change in momentum. It's 2P over C. Alright? Now, that's actually independent of wavelength for any given power. Now, if let's put the numbers in. Let's take a milliwatt. Let's take this laser pointer. That's a pretty good start. It's a picomewton. Wow. That's 10 to the minus 12 of a newton. Right, so we're not getting worried about that, are we? So let's forget this experiment. When you, turn, when you go into the lab and do any optics experiment and you turn your laser on, you do not see the optics move, hopefully. Alright, unless somebody knocks it. Okay? So a million millionth of a newton isn't something to really get worried about. Or is it? Well, that's fine, that's, a, that's fair enough. But let's suppose we make, do a simple sort of Newtonian argument and say, let's make the mass of the object really, really small. Of course, if I make an object half the diameter, it's one-eighth of the weight, right? It's a cubic relationship if I've got the same density. So imagine now scaling right down to the size of a cell and atom. Incredibly, as Ashkin surmised, you could get brilliant effects going on at that scale. So he said, right, this is no good for moving objects that I'm interested or you're interested in a macroscopic domain. However, it seems to me very worthwhile to do things at the small domain. Right, so the first experiments that he did were akin to this. So this is a student of a colleague of mine I've worked with for the last decade, uh, Gabe Spaulding, and this is at Illinois Wesleyan University, which is two hours south of Chicago. And here on a, a nice sunny day, they're doing an experiment where they're sort of levitating a ball. All right? And here you've got a jet of water going up, you've got your American football, they balance the ball, the water shoots everywhere, all right? And the ball sort of levitates for a while. Get very well, it's a bit of fun. Okay? And the idea is we're going to do that at the microscopic scale. And indeed you can. So here you see droplets of water just from an atomizer or a perfume or aftershave spray coming down and a laser beam going up. And incredibly, particles stop. Now, all of them stop because some of them are going too fast or they've got the wrong trajectory or there's maybe a bit of dirt in them. I don't know. It's not, very, it's not a very controlled experiment. But you just let the whole thing run, and every so often, wait, wait, 
So, the forces of light can be, be done. Just, you can go and set this up at home. All you need is a glass cylinder, a little atomizer spray, and the laser going on. All right? Make sure you put a block on the top for laser safety. All right? Because the other way. Okay? That's optical levitation. And here, the reason they fall out is because there's air currents. I haven't taken any care here to try and um, damp out any motion due to air currents. But you can see that you can levitate particles. What did Ashkin do then? Well, what he really wanted to do was get away from levitating in air. So the first sort of seminal experiment in 1970, here, and it's great to read the old papers. You'll have seen a wonderful, wonderful science in the last two weeks, and you'll continue to see that this week. But I very much encourage you not to think of just a later scientific paper. All right? Science is complex. And you know what? There's a natural tendency to take a very complex paper you read in a, a journal like that optic letters or physrev letters or whatever, and to make it even more complex and say, hey, I can do a bit better. One of the greatest things I found as a student was actually going right back to the origin of papers of some of the pioneers of the field and saying, why did I actually do that? And, it, and Ashkin is no exception. Anyway, let's think about how we create a trap. So we're not really interested in air. We're interested in liquid <coughs> a, lot, a lot of the time. We could be interested in vacuum for atoms. Um, you'll hear about that, I think, in separate lectures. But for my purposes, if you're interested in a cell or a biological molecule, DNA, RNA, you're interested in a liquid, in other words. So the first idea was, rather than having things levitated, was to have two jets of water or lightning coming, for example, towards me. It's really simple. There's no lenses involved. Right? So I'm here in liquid, I'm swimming around, and there's a jet of light coming towards you that way and that way, and it stops me in the middle. Now, of course, the physics here is slightly different to the ball levitating, because the ball was not transparent. Of course, these particles are. And so this leads us to what we call a scattering force and a gradient force, which we'll come on to. Well, well how can we implement this? Well, Ashkin first did this with low numerical aperture lenses, gently focused beams in a cubette with some liquid. And then my apprentices group in 1993, or 94, um, in this paper, what they actually did was realize you could do it with fiber optics. These are two standard single mode fibers. You can go set this up within a, within a few days of the background. It's pretty easy to do. And here, what you see are particles moving back and forth. How do they move back and forth? Well, you just basically crank up or lower the power, for example, in each of the beams. You see the single mode for those of you in the front there. All right? You can vary. Why is this exciting? It's because we can now hold objects with these Pika Newton forces at will. Here, we're using, this is not, I should say, the famous optical tweezers. It's very important that there's different names given to different things. And this is using a separate trap to load it, for example. What can people do with this? We'll see in a second what people can do. But you can see that the beautiful na nature of this is it's fiber optics is integrated. The alignment's pretty easy. The other thing is there's no high numerical aperture optics, except, of course, the optics I need to visualize the particle. That means this is fantastic for microfluidic chambers and so forth. All right? It means I don't have to worry about putting little micro lenses and things in the chamber. And there we go. We're moving things around. All right? And you, you'll hear, of course, I think, in Carl Lenz's lectures about combining traps with spectroscopy and other directions. And this is one of the traps that people think about using. It's not the only one you can do tweezers. But trapping is part of the toolkit, and that can be combined. This has become very, very popular to do that. OK. And uh, I should, of course, thank Monica Rich Martin for this very nice video. She's at Innsbruck and, and runs a very nice group there doing lots of studies with fiber traps and holography. And she, too, is embedded, I think, in the medical school. So um, what you'll find is a lot of the work is very interdisciplinary, which is very exciting, I think, for people starting out. What can you do? Now, I, I deliberately try not to overemphasize my own work to give you a balance. It's very easy for me to come and tell you how wonderful everything we're doing is, but I think it's very fine about our work. There's an amazing number of wonderful groups out there doing things such as selective things that I'm not involved in, just to give you, a, a try and give you a balanced portfolio of what's going on. Right, let's think about your eye. Your eyes are very important, and of course, laser damage to your eye can be very, very, um, very much of an issue. Amazingly, the eye is really rather funny. Believe it or not, at the back of the eye, the very receptors that we have, all right, essentially have something like a ground glass surface in front of it. If you wanted to make an artificial eye, 
you probably would not follow what nature is doing. All right? And people have been um, worried about what on earth is going on. So basically, there's this layer of cells, and somehow the light gets from there through some other cellular matrix back to your photoreceptors. Incredible. This is the work of Franz et al. This is Joachim Gork's group, who's now at the University of Cambridge. This is, and so there are these things called Muller cells, and these beautiful cells at the back of your eye, everybody's got them, they're acting like mini optical fibers. How can we ever test that? All right? So what they did, this is the neuron here, the soma of the body, and the foot, and this has all been measured, this is actually uh, adherence. And so what these people did was they took one of these cells, here's my dual beam fiber trap, and they aligned it within the trap, the cell. Put two fibers pointing towards one. It's a really simple experiment. All right, then you take your 1064, you usually use infrared light, and you send it down here, and this time you have a splitter and you collect what comes out with a power meter. Now, light diverges from a single mode optical fiber. However, if this cell is acting like an optical fiber, it will couple light from one fiber to the other. Incredibly, they measure that. Nanowires. And they measure the transmission of single fibers at the back of your retina. Okay? So this is a, one of the top ten selected papers of the year in this journal, PNAS, uh, for example, which just shows you the type of Yep. Just a quick question. How do I know it's a single fiber, single cell? So how do you know? It's a single cell. Couldn't it be multiple cells? Right, that's an excellent question. So what people do is when they spin these cells down, they can, they can visualize. So you can actually see what you're actually trapping in with a high numerical aperture. So these cells are actually of micron size. So it's very easy to see if you've got one or two there. And usually people use such a dilute solution that the probability of grabbing what two is very, very low. Okay, so the, the, I think that's a level of control of the heat. You can see one fiber there, basically closing the loop. All right? And they did this statistically over many cells, because each cell might be different. And one could imagine looking at the transmission by color. You can actually add another light source down your fiber. Who knows? You can do other experiments. So that's, one of the, I think, one of the nice experiments over the last uh, five years using this dual beam trap. Now, let's suppose I put um, a different cell in between these two beams, okay? So I've got two beams and I'm trapped. If I'm a colloidal particle, I'm pretty rigid, right? I'm not going to actually squash or expand or anything. Now imagine I put a beach ball in between these two jets of water. What's going to happen to the beach ball? Squeezes or shoot out the side. Yeah, it could shoot out the side or it would get squashed or something, right? Now, what do you think might happen if I put a normal mammalian cell in between these two fibers. What do you think? It's squishy. All right, cells are squishy, right? They'll pop. Huh? They'll pop. They'll pop. And we think naively it'll squash down and pop, right? It doesn't. It's counterintuitive. All right. So if we now go to, now I'm not going to get involved in the Abraham Minkowski, but if, you, if this is a very simple way of understanding the momentum of light in a dielectric medium, this is the Minkowski formulation. We don't need to worry about that for today, but you can actually derive this the other way as well. Okay, so that's the momentum of light. And there's my cell. And as a physicist, sometimes we use spheres. Here we could use a square. Okay, I'm going to pretend it's a cell. Okay, there's a cell, and it's got a refractive index of 1.5 or something, or, well, actually 1.4 or so, and that's water. And then I'm just going to write down what the mass is. Conservation momentum. Light comes to an interface. Sun's reflective, sun's transparent. Okay, if I do that, incredibly, you know what happens? The force is actually away from the surface. It bulges towards the light beam. It expands. Who's ever bought fruit at a supermarket and actually picked up a nectarine or a peach or a plum and actually thought, think, thought of whether it's ripe or not? You've all done that, right? Right, what do you do? You squash it. Cells are the same. This is actually a cell squasher, or as termed by Joseph Cass and Joachim Gork, the optical stretcher. It squashes quill cells out. All right? That's the physics of why it does that. That's naught. So the red arrows show you the direction of the ultimate change in momentum and force. That's incredible. So, take home message from that slide. Don't worry about maths if you don't want to. Kept it reasonably simple. But uh, when it leaves, a dielectric medium high refractive index, there's a force out of it. 
counterintuitive to what you would see from a normal um, beach ball. This is what they do. They flow cells between these two light beams and basically they squash them like you might test fruit. Now why on earth would you want to squash a cell anyway? Like you're trapping it, but now we're squashing it. Well, in fact, what happens is cells have basically a scaffold known as the actin cytoskeleton, which I'm sure we'll hear about in other talks during the week. And the actin cytoskeleton basically gives the cell a rigidity. Now, it turns out that when cells basically become abnormal or near plastic, and they um, basically undergo changes inside them, the actin cytoskeleton can change. And basically, one finds that metastatic cells in certain conditions are basically squashier than the healthy cells. So these guys, what they're doing is they're squashing cells one by one, and they get a reasonable throughput now, and they can distinguish normal breast cancer cells from cancerous ones, just by looking at the ellipticity of the cell. There's no actual damage here, it's all done at um, wavelengths where there's no, little to no absorption, but the very squashiness tells me basically what's going on. And where, how do we know that? There's deformability. And you might say, well, okay, we've got distributions. That's the issue. And of course, in biology, and unlike physics, that's always what we're doing here. The heterogeneity of life and samples. But, if you look at that distribution, and you went to a doctor and you said, well, I've got a lot of cells that are over, say, 20 or 25 percent, that might be cause for concern to take you onto another test. It's not a be-all or end-all, but it's an indicator. You can see, with no damage whatsoever, what I'm doing is squashing cells and actually working out how we might treat them. So, if you're interested, these papers here will show you that, and that's an actual cell squash there. Now, there's a probably, I don't actually know the groups I was working with, but probably at least two dozen groups have these types of cell stretches and doing work right around the world. Okay? So, this actual idea has become very, very popular, and in fact, um, there's also now if you talk, Joseph Cass is the guy I guess you want to go and see if you want to know more about this. It's, it's, he's actually doing it for studies um, of many things. What sort of things can you do? If you have a culture, you take your cells, you can stretch or squash them, and then basically you can sort them out if you want. And there's many carcinomas that are difficult to find. Oral carcinomas are. So, if you look at your tongue, it already looks red and lumpy, right? So if there's something wrong with it, it's really very hard for somebody to actually find out what's normal tissue or not. So, but that's actually one of the most difficult cancers to potentially to find. And here, for example, they, they're doing tests in Germany now um, to see clinical trials to see if they can pick up early diagnosis of oral cancer using this technique. Okay? And these can be regulated markers as well. This is marker free. I've not, I've not added anything to any of the cells. That's the beauty of optical. It's if you like an intrinsic um, marker, but of course, cells once again the heterogeneity etc makes things very difficult sometimes to pin down with one test. So we really need a varied optical toolkit. Right. So in that video from Monica Rich Marder's group, you saw me loading the fiber trap with a single optical tweezer. How do I get that? How do I? I don't really want to use fibers all the time. I've just got a microscope at home and a laser. I just want to get trapping with that. How do I do that? And that's the most famous trap, known as the optical tweezers trap, 3D trap. Now, this, is, um, this can be understood in a number of ways. And, of course, the light matter interaction, as you'll see, and I think um, Timo may be talking a lot about the math behind this, so, of course, can be understood in different ways, depending on, of course, the size scales relative to the optical wavelength that we employ. All right? So the famous regime is the Rayleigh regime, where the particle is incredibly small relative to the wavelength, or we get to the very easy and easiest regime to understand, the Mi regime, where the particle it actually exceeds the laser wavelength dramatically, and all we need to do is use the basic Fresnel equations. Okay, so there. Now, if you do that, you can use basically that and Newton's law. So what are we going to do? Here's my object, and for simplicity, I've ignored the reflected beam. And what have I done? I've got two rays of light coming in. And this diagram shows all the physics you need to remember. One ray is drawn thicker than the other. And that means there is a gradient of intensity on the scale of the object, typically. In other words, that's more intense than that. Now, if they were both the same intensity, 
then basically these two arrows would be about the same. But what you can see from that is that light enters left to right, but basically the little ball or colloid or cell, call it what you will, is actually bending more light down than up. If it does that, the object will move to compensate. Every action has a reaction. I make the light go down, the object will go up. If it goes up, it is moving towards the brighter part of the beam. If the refractive index of the object is larger than its length. Okay, that's so incredibly, like a little lens, it actually bends on. So, if I now do that, what I can do is I can take a single beam, and what do I need to do? I need to create a gradient on the size of the object. What is the size of the object? Well, it was a cell or an atom. So I've got to get down to a micron size beam, right? I've got to, this laser point is about a few millimeters across. So if I focus it through a high numerical aperture optic, I'll get a beam that's sort of microns across and has an intensity gradient that falls off. That's it there. There's my object. So the object bends the light to the left, so the object moves to the right. So if I do that, here comes my light beam, down, <coughs> it falls in. All right? And then, if you believe that physics, it means that basically the object will stay where the beam's brightest. And so if I have my light beam and I wiggle it around, I'll do this. All sounds great. If you can hear that, there's something, there's something making sense. I'm stable. What I don't really want that much. I like to be stable. How am I going to do that? Well, I just use the same physics, but instead of the lateral direction, I use it in the axial direction. How do I create a gradient in the axial direction? Well, I've done it anyway because focus the light beam down. Okay, and if I do that, the light coming in, as you can see in the right hand diagram, comes in at a sharp skew angle, it leaves the object going down, so the object moves up towards the beam focus. Alright, there we go. And so it finds an equilibrium position. Now of course there's a scattering force involved here, in this very simple picture which I've overlooked just for simplicity, but you find that the, in this, the position of the trap is just below the focus here. So um, this is an example of what you, here's the heart of a basic trap, single beam tweezers, and this is the famous optical tweezers. You pick a frequency or laser wavelength to avoid obtecution, obtecution is like electrocution, but even with these low powers, because you've got a high uh, power density, here's a little, that's actually to scale that for me, the Google scale for shows you what we can do, try and drag it out. The power depends on your application, do we want to trap one object, hundreds of objects, the beam quality is important because I want to get a tight focus, so when you're purchasing a laser, the M squared and the beam pointing stability is important. And objective lenses, typically, in fact, that's maybe a little bit too high. You can get that maybe about NA of 1 or so and more. It varies which paper you read or what people can do, but you need a high numerical average to get the 3D track. Okay? So that's really basic track. Let's see it in action. So on the left, you see a 1064 nanometer beam held with water with about 10 milliwatts of laser light. And you can see it's moved around with no damage. So it's microscale, it's non-invasive, and it's reconfigurable. I can move the light beam around where I like. Now I can do one or two things. If we're trying, if imagine we're all in a sample chamber, I can actually have the beam come down and then steer the beam around to wherever I like to trap. Or I can trap somebody and move the sample stream. Okay, and you'll see both. Here we're moving the beam. Then we're going to hold the beam station. For a second, maybe we're not. Um, I'll start with the while, while we wait for that to happen. There we go. And now we're going to move the sample state. How small can we go? Um, we've just trapped uh, 10 nanometers in our lab, and I think another group in the world has done that. You can get down to a single atom. You can trap nanoparticles. Some of you have heard about the importance of nanoparticles. Nanoparticles, plasmonics. This is a particle, a 100 nanometer particle. Well, look at all the other particles moving around. Why are they moving around so fast? It's Brownian motion. All right? You can think of Brownian dynamics as a particle goes from one micron down to tens of nanometers. Look at that. You can trap them and see them. You can see the different colors due to the different plasmon resonances. I might actually talk a little bit about that on Thursday in my second talk. Let me just, I just put some very basic equations down so everybody knows what's 
The gradient force is related to the polarizability and, not surprisingly, the gradient intensity in scattering the later ion. What's polarizability mean? Well, polarizability is, is something that you, you know, when you induce a dipole, for example, in material. Essentially, for a dielectric object, we're looking at something that's related to volume. So basically, if I give you a 1 micron B and a 100 nanometer B, there's a factor of 1,000 in polarizability. That's why people will readily show you objects like this, but they will not be able to show you too many objects of this size that are dielectric. Oh, hold on, what am I trapping there? You just said you trapped from the 100 nanometer tech. That's not dielectric, it's gold. And metallic particles are amazingly polarizable. All right, it's really easy to trap a metal particle down. Seeing it is another right issue. But um, you can actually trap them quite readily. And that's because they're amazingly polarizable. We'll talk about that maybe in my fourth lecture. Okay? So that gives you the span of where this field can do. How do we understand um, forces if we're not in the Mi regime? I guess Timo will explain forces in a much more um, rigorous way than I thought here probably today. So, if you want to look in the Rayleigh regime where particles are very small, you think of the particles as a dipole, it basically minimizes energy by going to the brightest part of the field. And here, for example, it's, it's very much like the idea of increasing capacitors in between two plates, and so the, the particle goes to where the field is highest. All right? So, for example, that's where it would go here in the axial direction. Now, some of you may know the field of dielectrophoresis, which also actually uses oscillating electric fields. So here, not an optical wavelength, which is what we're interested in this week, but at not much uh, uh, slower fields. And that field is actually very much analogous to this. Okay? And it's parallel. But basically, I just wanted to get across the point that gradients are the key. So, whether you think of rubber balls, uh, golf balls, energy forces, etc., when the physicist says, in a tweet, that everything goes to my waist, He's not talking about getting back into their genes, they're talking about creating an optical trap. Let me just compare. A lot of people wonder about these forces. And is that force useful? Because right at the beginning I said Pika Newton. Is it worth worrying about Pika Newton? Okay, I can trap something, but what can I do with it? Does it really matter? Alright, so there's an example of what a Pika Newton is. If you're going to read the lecture notes tonight, which you might do. <laughs> That's the gravitational force of attraction between you and the lecture. Or a penny, or the millionth of a weight of a grain of salt. Pretty pathetic, right? Okay, but is that pathetic in the world of molecular motors and atomic physics? Well, we'll leave atomic physics aside. But no, because the AFM, for example, these are things that you can measure. This word motors is very important. Our cell is full of what we call linear and rotary motors. Linear motors are such as kinesian motion or microtubules. Actin myosin, which is related to um, ATP to ADP conversion of phosphate. Okay? Bacterial flagella motors, ion exchange across membranes. The list is very large and I won't go into it. All of these have been studied by optical tweezers. This has undergone a revolution. The biggest area of impact optical tweezers have is not in physicists. It's one of the true technique that has revolutionized single molecule biophysics. Up to 1985, everything was done with ensembles can now do things with single molecules readily with this technique. And you cannot really get there with the air tech. That's why everybody gets very excited. Now many people say, why don't we crank up the laser, crank up the power and get bigger forces and do more? But there are some applications really bigger forces. However, that's more and beautiful. Because the forces we need here, motor proteins here, are all in the Pekingese. I can't really break a covalent bond. I'm not interested, but there's no other competing technology really for optical tweezers. They're the most beautiful, exquisite force transducers known at this same scale. And you can now get down to femtonewtons or better in a lab at room temperature at the bottom of the field. That's pretty exciting. And it's revolution. Okay? So do bear that in mind. That just gives you a flavour of the types of things you want to do. <clears throat> so this is just, uh, I'll, I won't bore too much on this, this is more rigorous how you might look at the forces, for example, this again shows scattering force related to intensity, n is the ratio of refractive indices, the gradient here, and this is from this paper by Harada and Akusara. So basically gradient forces must compete with scattering forces to reach an equilibrium to get to what 
um, we have. But remember, there's other factors as well, which are we have included absorption. So for example, I'm doing gold particles, etc. things would be a little bit different. We see also the wavelength dependency as well. What about laser wavelength that you might use? Of course, I've said there's little to no absorption, but in fact, many people have looked at the efficiency of cloning, for example. So here, if we look at near-infrared, which is very, very popular, you can see here that, uh, well, you could see here. Um, okay. All right, there we go. Um, so for E. coli cells, we get optical damage minimized at 830 and 970. So you can see the cloning efficiency going up. The basic rule of thumb, a lot of people say, what laser shall I buy for my optical tweezers experiment in biology? This is the classic question you always get. I would say, of course, this is for a certain type of cell. You need to go and do your own viability study with the cell you're interested in. Because every year, body's experiment will be different. They'll use a different objective. They'll use different power. They'll have different beam shapes. They'll have, et cetera. They want to hold the cell for a different length of time. This is a good guide to where you want to work. You might need a tunable laser, you may need to do lots of study. So it's not trivial just to buy a laser in this range. But most people, as ease, get away with something like a 1064 laser, which is pretty cheap and cheerful, and you can get one very, very quickly. And this paper has more details on that, should you wish. So these are the three trapping geometries. There's the levitation trap, remember the rugby ball? The two beam trap, remember we looked at the Muller cells, looking at transmission of light at the back of the retina, and then you've got your optical tweezers trap. There are many possible trapping geometries. These are not the only one. There's many things, like near-field traps, for example. And only this one's really, I guess, technical, the famous optical tweezers from Arthur Ashby. So maybe I think I'll stop there for a few minutes and give everybody a break. So in the next lecture, what I think I'll do is show you how we turn this into real measuring apparatus and also how we get into novel beams. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.